Hello, my name's Anna Vick. Thank you for joining us this evening. Today's conversation is one of our favorite topics here at Push for Empowered Pregnancy. We are discussing fetal movements and why it is so important for you for your pregnancy to get to know your baby's normal patterns and to really understand what is going on in your womb, especially as you're nearing the end of your pregnancy. This conversation doesn't always happen with your provider. So we definitely want to go over as much information as we can on this topic. And so today's guest is somebody that really doesn't need an introduction. So I'm not going to give it, but I'll let him say a little bit about himself. Dr. Hiesel, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah. Hi, Anna. Um, uh, so my name's Alex Hiesel. I'm Professor of Obstetrics at the um, University of Manchester. Um, and that means that I spend half my time doing research and half my time um, looking after uh, pregnant mums um, and particularly in our pregnancy after loss service um, in Manchester. We'll give you an additional plug here as far as why we love you so much is that you run the Tommy's Clinic which of course Faye got in love with when she was looking for pregnancy after loss care and started to research that we don't have anything like it here in the United States and so Faye why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about that clinic and you know, why it's so important as far as care. And then we'll go into some questions about the fetal movement. And I don't know if I said my name. My name is Anna Vic. I think I said at the beginning. And I am a lost mother. Unfortunately, I lost my son, um, Owen, which would have been seven this last week, um, sadly, because of stillbirth. And I was not fully informed about this topic. My doctors gave me a pamphlet when I got pregnant, they said. And that was kind of the extent of discussion here. So I do think it's very valuable as far as a tool for prevention of stillbirth. So I'm very happy to have this conversation. Hi, Faye. Hi, Anna. Hi, Professor. I love how you put me in the spot, although <laughs> we talked about not to. Um, so I had two losses. One was um, George, that was in 2017, but he had a genetic abnormality. So I think I accept that better. Then I had Natalie, that was five, was five months pregnant. And then with Natalie, I was uh, nine months pregnant, 38 weeks. I was perfect baby. And I felt weird changing in movement. Got in labor, went into labor the next day just to find out that she didn't have a heartbeat. I was, I think I was obsessed about learning about stillbirth at the time. Um, that was my way of coping and I found Tommy's and the Rainbow Clinic in UK and the model. And I was looking at the numbers and I, I was going to a lot of OBGYNs in New York to ask if it could happen again and nobody could really answer me. So I thought it was only get, gonna get pregnant again if I was gonna go to London, which my dad considered. <laughs> my husband was like, no. Um, then we had the idea of bringing that care model here to United States. Thank you, Faye. I have to put you on the spot because we're very proud of what you've done. And, you know, after having that discussion with Dr. Hiesel about what they're doing over there and you decided that that was something that we could possibly do in the United States, I mean, it got done quite quickly. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Because I'm actually really intrigued about how it got to the next step. I know some people are actually interested in doing an additional hopefully in other states here. So they've asked me as well. It's like, what does it take to start a rainbow clinic? In terms of what it takes to start a rainbow clinic, I think is the first thing is staff who are um, interested and um, who are able to, um, to, to have ultrasound facilities um, and a good understanding of what parents need. Um, and an ability to provide continuity so that you get to see the same provider um, throughout your pregnancy and also work together with the support of people that have already got a rainbow clinic so they can support you through that. So um, a lot of the model of care isn't rocket science. Um, we do some cool ultrasound and we, we think we've got ways of working out which babies we should be most worried about. But actually, most of um, what we do um, technologically, we could do in most places. It's about sort of how you structure care um, and also you know, interact with mums and, 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 when you, and families and when you do that. 
I think also it's important to mention that when you when you told me that you just separate one afternoon for the lost moms. So you have a clinic up and running. Yeah. And you separate one afternoon to start that care. It doesn't seem like a big burden in any clinic that wants to do that. So it's just the will of um, to do that. And more, maybe more appointments, more sympathy, empathy. And, and, and understanding, you know, <clears throat> that, that I think, you know, just an ability to say to people, you know, what you're feeling, the anxiety or whatever feelings that they have, you know, it's not necessarily nice, but it's normal and it's okay. And, you know, the number of people who sort of start their appointments with me saying, you know, you're going to think I'm mad and you kind of say, no, you're not mad. You're the same as everybody else. Um, you know, and I think, and, and there's a degree of reassurance you can get from that, you know, that you're not, um, you're not alone um, and that your caregiver knows that. And, and is able to sort of, um, you know, to convey that to you is an important thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a perfect recipe for better outcome too, just in general, which sadly, yeah. you know, in a lot of our losses, I feel like we're like, ah, we didn't really li like our provider. We didn't really feel like they listened. You know, there's a dynamic there that's not quite right. Yeah, no, I think that's, and that's really sad. I think, um, actually you know i guess this brings us back to the baby movement the thing we were having our conversation about is that um you know listening to mums is a really important thing to do um, and, and actually having a good relationship between the care provider and um mums whether that's a lost mum or a mum in her first pregnancy or whoever actually you know having a good practitioner patient relationship is the bedrock of everything exactly so if anybody is watching and you want to have a rainbow clinic in your area just reach out to fernanda i'll give her email to you no just kidding fernanda are you comfortable sharing i think that's probably the first step because we do have a training program as far as the empathy side and all that we've established that and then there's obviously other steps that we can help with but we do want to see this spread i mean tommy's how many clinics do you have over there uh, we have um, over 25 now in wow. the uk and we're, we're really proud to be able to work with the team at, at mount sinai as well um you know that that was <clears throat> that's been a, a, a great link up and we're really thankful for that too yeah, that's amazing. Well, congratulations, everyone. So yes, we'll get to the topic now. So we want to discuss fetal movement and how understanding your baby's pattern can help prevent stillbirth and just a better outcome, because I know there's a lot in fetal movement that can mean other things as well, not just that your baby is in huge distress, but it could just be to your pregnancy is having some issues. So uh, why don't you give us a little bit of information as far as what you've found in your research? Why is this so important for people to know about? So I think um, fecal movements is a really good example of where um, research has been really helpful. So we've known for a long time that n a normal pattern of movements um, tells us that baby is well. Um, and um, probably 40 years ago, people then began to explore the idea that less movements or fewer movements or an abnormal pattern of baby movements could be a sign that baby wasn't well. Um, and to start off with, um, when we've sort of, in the last maybe 10, 15 years, there's been more interest in this in a sort of part of a stillbirth prevention um, package. Um, and actually there have been a, the idea is that a baby's movements are less um, because the placenta is not giving it as much oxygen and nutrients. And so the first piece of research that's been really important is there are now four studies that have shown um, in different countries, different parts of the world, that women who come with reduced movements actually have higher rates of um placental pathology 
Um, and so actually there is evidence that the placentas of babies with reduced movements are not as healthy and don't transfer nutrients as effectively. So I think that's really important to remember at the bottom of all of this is there's some really good hard science research that shows that some mums, their placentas aren't working so well. And then there's been lots of studies over the years that have shown that mums who notice their baby is moving less have a higher rate of stillbirth than mums who notice their, their baby's movements are either the same or they are um, um, even, you know, sort of a really active baby. So if you like, a, an, an active baby has the lowest rate of stillbirth. Baby's movement staying the same um, is kind of the, the, the reference point. And then babies that move less have a higher rate of stillbirth. Um, so then what people have tried to do is to do all sorts of different things. Um, and so about 30 years ago, there was a clinical trial that was based on 10 movements in 12 hours, which we now know is at the absolute kind of lowest end of what would be normal for a baby. So, it was, And it was also applied to everybody. So even if your baby normally moved 100 times a day, and then one day it moved 20 times a day, then they would say that was still fine, even though that baby was moving a fifth of the amount of times that, that it would have been. Um, normal for that baby. So, and that showed that there was no difference in the stillbirth rate between the groups. And so for quite a number of years, that stopped anybody doing any more trials because everybody said, well, you know, there's awareness of baby movements doesn't, doesn't work in inverted commas. But actually what you have to remember is that that clinical trial was never actually testing awareness of baby movements. It was testing a very specific way using these kick charts and that's one of the reasons that we don't tend to recommend routine use of kick charts particularly not using the count to 10 method in 12 hours just because 10 movements in 12 hours like i said is the absolute lowest that you would expect an, a healthy baby to have mm -hmm. um so um in fact it's much lower than what you'd expect a healthy baby to have um, so different other studies now have looked at maybe trying a mobile phone app. There was a big study from Australia did that. There was a study from um, at Sweden where they looked at sort of focusing. They called it mind fetalness and sort of focusing on babies' movements. Um, now, again, if you look at these separately, they haven't reduced the amount of stillbirths but there's lots of other beneficial effects they seem to have had. So um, they, um, you know, being aware of your baby's movement seems to increase the bonding between mum and baby. It actually reduces mum's anxiety. So actually far from increasing it, which a lot of providers are often worried about, if we tell people to be aware of their movements, you know, everyone's going to be really anxious. Actually, that's not the case. If we give women information, their anxiety goes down. Um, there are fewer babies admitted to the NICU. There are fewer neonatal deaths. So there's lots of benefits. Um, and so um, I, I think what we need to do is to move away from these sort of rigid, you know, alarm limits, many of which were never really developed in a very robust way um, in a general population um, and actually listen to, to mum. So if a mum comes and says, I'm not happy with my baby's movements, my baby's moving less than it was, then you know we should take that, that we should take that seriously. Mm -hmm. And I know you're quite comfortable with saying less, and I know you don't necessarily want to have this conversation, but we did just make a post with mommy labor nurse confirming that if you have kind of a wild surge at any point that there might be something going on and you know there's not a lot of so, studies so, that per se but yeah. in, on well, anecdotal, so, anecdotal with families uh, and, no, I, I think it's more than anecdotal I think that um 
you know, when we talk to mums in Rainbow Clinic and things, and you talk to mums after a baby stillbirth, there are definitely a group of women whose babies do go crazy and then their movements just stop. Mm. The problem that we've had is, and, and you, you, you see again, you see the same association with this bit of really, this, this one off period of very, very vigorous activity and then a cessation of baby's activity and not, um, and, and we see that link with stillbirth. Now, the problem is when we've tried to do something useful with that um, and, and say, can we do it the other way around? Um, and there was a Chinese study and there was our study from Liverpool and Manchester. And um, we didn't see a link with the pathology that we saw in reduced movement. So, and that was a surprise to us. And I think partly it is about language and how we describe it. Mm -hmm. And so when we were collecting mums for the prospective studies, there were some mums that might ring up and say, you know, my baby is just really active today. And that's not the same actually, I don't think, as this description of almost like baby having a seizure inside. It's really frantic activity. And the problem that we have is, is how, how do we, um, how do we translate that into the clinical world, into advice that's useful? Now, I guess it comes back to the fact that we should listen to mums. So if a mum says, I am concerned, and I am concerned because my baby is just going absolutely nuts, well then, you know, I think it's absolutely fine to do a non-stress test to say, you know, is baby okay or not? Um, now, at the moment, like I say, I, th I think for just the whole population, I don't think we're quite ready to, we haven't got the words quite right where we would be able to say to somebody, this is what the problem is, you need to come in. And um, but, so I think it all comes back to if you're worried. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'll just add the reason I'm bringing this up is because I run a group for cord loss parents. Oops, sorry. Um, so it comes up in a lot of the stories of mothers who had an accident with cord knots or compressions or entanglement and that sort of thing. And so they remember it prior to the loss, like you said, very frantic, very, you know, like, let's just say the way I think it's Dr. Kleiman describes it. Like if you're scuba diving and someone clamps the, you know, source of your air, you would frantically move in a situation like that to get more air, get, get out of position, you know, get in a better position. So I think that is actually how a lot of us with cord accidents experience the stillbirth and then you know it's that which is obviously at a time we're very pivotal like I don't even know how you would really get your baby you know help fast enough if that's happening because that means the cord is you know keeping oxygen from coming to your baby at that point but I would think you would need to be immediately seen like go in right away and then like you said have the doctor listen and do an NST and see if there's something going on. Maybe they can catch that the cord is in some format, like mm -hmm. you know, a new cord and it's a short cord or whatever the case, because I think that that is very key. We don't talk about that enough. And I know the research is not powerful enough and all that, but we have so many families talking about it that I just want to bring it out because it's definitely like in a lot of our stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's really important to, that, that actually, that's our starting point for research so i would always encourage people to have those conversations with providers because if we don't and researchers because if we don't have those conversations then we don't get our research questions right so i think it's really important that um you know we don't dismiss things as anecdote and you know i think one of the advantages i've i've felt over the years of, of having the conversations in Rainbow Clinic and, and also with bereaved parents after that, you know, coming back for their postnatal visit is that people, 
you know that's when you learn stuff when you're listening to people you think oh you know <clears throat> you know that that's where all the ideas for the fecal movement research came it was it was clinicians listening to to mums who'd lost babies who were telling them all the time their baby was moving less and they, it was moving less for much longer than their baby had been dead for this wasn't simply you know no movements because the baby had died yeah so right. have those conversations we're, actually, we're live right now so i want to read you one of the parents story here she said my stillborn baby had both combined significant decrease in movement for five days one evening of really crazy activity which was actually similar to his normal movement before the decrease and then the next day at a normal appointment they found out that he was dead when i told them the moment of the movement was decreased they told me it was just fine that his movement was so reduced for his normal as long as i felt any kind of movement for like 10 in an hour but i told them they were um, they were just so weak compared to his normal um she would have given anything if they'd done the nsd mm -hmm. so i guess they didn't do anything investigation wise and she brought this up so i think that's i mean i think so i think it's really important that we try and couple we need to couple things together, don't we? There's no point in, um, you know, really educating mums about awareness and when to go in and to present with concerns. If when mums present with concerns, they're just dismissed and, you know, then nothing happens. So, um, I mean, ideally, you know, we would, we would be able to, to encourage women to present when they're concerned and we would normally, I think as a rule of thumb, I normally say to mums, if you're worried, don't sleep on it. You know, if you're worried, go to hospital that evening. Don't kind of go to bed and think it's going to be OK. Um, but I'm really aware, as, as, that, as that person has said, that's not what people are being advised to do, sadly. Um, so, and we know that, the data suggests that between one in 50 and one in 100 non-stress tests are abnormal um, and need the baby to be born straight away. So when mums come to hospital, you know, thankfully, most babies are not in immediate, um, you know, in, 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 in immediate distress. But actually, one in 50 to one in 100 are, and that's quite a, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big number, I think. One to two percent of everybody who walks through the door, their baby's not, you know, we need to get that baby born. So that's, you know, that's that's important information to know about. And what do you tell the moms now that are listening to us? How do you teach them to track the movements or the pattern? Um, I mean, so we would normally say that most babies have a pattern by 28 weeks of pregnancy. Okay. Now, some really naughty babies still don't. And I always feel really sorry for my mums, particularly in the, in the pregnancy after loss clinic in Rainbow Clinic, um, whose babies still haven't got a pattern because they're, they're kind of already super stressed. Uh, but most babies do have a pattern by 28 weeks. Um, and, and that pattern may be like the time of day when a baby's active. It may be times when you're noticing it. For example, a lot of babies are most active in the early evening after, after a meal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also that may be the, the time when you're sitting down and being able to focus. So that may be, a, you know, also contribute to whether you're aware or not. Um, and I would say, yeah, if you're, um, if you're concerned that your baby is not moving either, we, we know that actually both the strength of the movements and the frequency of the movements are both important. So if your baby is not, you know, is moving less, significantly less strongly or significantly less frequently, then, you know, you should probably give your maternity provider a call i have another good question in the chat she was kind of asking you know how do we get providers to ask more about fetal movement because a lot of ours just say is baby moving okay today or is baby moving and it's very vague there's not really this conversation like i mentioned in my mm -hmm. story 
uh, about what does this even mean? Like, why should everybody be doing it? We don't discuss it with the low risk pregnancies really here. It's more high risk care that they start to mention fetal death and, you know, potential of stillbirth. So it's almost like, yeah, they're afraid to scare every mother, but we feel like we obviously get told everything about pregnancy otherwise. So why not this very important detail, you know, that could prevent? Yeah, I think it, I think some of it's about lack of confidence and people, um, um, we've just um, published a paper, actually there's an, an international group of us um, have just published a paper um, that talks about, you know, how to have that conversation. Um, because I think that's actually a really useful place to start because, you know, not, not necessarily assuming, um, assuming all of our professionals know where to start. I'll put it in the chat, Anna, so you can maybe put the link up on the, the website. Um, but that was a multidisciplinary group. So that was midwives and obstetricians um, and parents have put together um, this, this paper and we call it a framework for an antenatal conversation. So it's about, you know, how do we talk to people um, in the antenatal period? Perfect. I did add it to the chat. So if anyone wants to read that, feel free. I think I think it should be what we call open access. So that everybody should be able to click on that. Okay. I think. Maybe not, but it um, if, if anyone wants it, then do get in touch and we can we can try and sort a copy out for people. Perfect. Thank you. So another good one in the chat. Do you see it, Faye? Do you want to ask? Yeah, I see that. Um, so some doctors and nurses or even ultrasonographers, they tell you to, when you don't feel the baby moving and it happened to me going to the ultrasound, do go drink some juice or go drink, drink a hot chocolate and come back. Um, there, was there a research or on that or it's just a myth and we start believing on it? So I think, we know that babies will be, I think it sort of comes from the idea that we know that babies tend to move more after food. Um, and so I think the really important thing is that we should only really ever do that if a mum is not sure that her baby's moving less. Um, whereas if the mum is already saying to you, I know my baby's moving less, then you know, don't tell someone to go and drink some orange juice because you shouldn't, you know, what, what you need to be doing is putting someone on a non-stress test and, and, and finding out straight away, what, making sure the baby's alive and is it distressed? That's, that's the question you need to ask. If, um, you know, like I say, I would only ever advocate that if someone rang up and said, look, I'm just not sure when my baby's moving normally or not. You know, I'd say, well, you know, how worried are you? And if they say, well, I'm not that worried. So, well, you know, drink, you know, have a drink um, and and think, you know, focus on baby's movements for two hours. And then if you're not happy, I want to see you. If they've already called me up and said, my baby's not moving normally, then then their baby's not moving normally. They don't, I don't want them to wait any longer. Right. So we're working on a consensus statement that we're going to go around the internet and they did something similar in the UK. So we're having, I think you're actually one of the doctors that is okaying our wording that we're going to erase the internet mm -hmm. of misconceptions on fetal movement. And that's kind of where this paper really originates from. We feel like if you're Googling in the middle of the night, is my baby moving like normal? That should be a sign to yourself that you are concerned you need to go in right now. So that whole document is pretty much saying that. It's not giving you advice for kick counting. It's not telling you to drink anything. We're just saying go to get checked out immediately yeah. because we do feel like if you're looking that up, there's a reason, you know. So we actually, Google was super helpful. Um, so uh, if you Google that, um, it used to bring up all sorts of stuff, some of which was helpful, some of which wasn't. And we were actually able to work with Google um, to sift out some of the bad information. Um, and so now it um, you get much you get much better advice now. 
So you work directly with Google? Yeah, so actually there was someone in Google contacted us. Um, um, and they were, they were really, really helpful. Um, so yeah, it, it, um, it, it now signposts to, um, you know, um, much more sort of evidence-based sources and things. So um, yeah, that was really positive. So it was really good because we know that we can't regulate what's on the internet. But it's really good to see that, you know, search engines can begin to, you know, signpost people to information that's going to help rather than hinder. Right. So the majority of like, if you do search it up, it might tell you to drink juice still or ice mm. water. So there's still some. So we're going to try to comb the Internet this next project after the big push. Uh, we're actually almost done with the statement. And so we're really excited to be able to do that because we do feel like the people who will Google in the middle of the night because they can't talk to the provider and maybe they never had this conversation, they should just get the simplest form of this, which is, you know, if you already know your baby's normal, you're already familiar and you're already concerned, that means the next step is to go right in right away and get checked yeah. out. And then like, as we discussed a little bit though, what would the provider have to do to fully check your baby out because then we're putting them in the hands of the providers mm. here that may or may not do the same protocol since we don't have one for a stillbirth mm. prevention. So what so, should I so, what to ask for? Because, you know, we're going in as a, a patient. We don't know what should be done. We just come so, in. And so I think that, that what we need to do is to, that there are, there are three really important questions that we need to answer. The first question is, is my baby alive? That's the first really important question, because sadly, we know that um, that baby's movement stopping or, or significantly reducing is sometimes a sign that baby has already passed away. Um, and if that's the case, then um, we need to, you know, there's obviously all of the things that happen after a baby needs to die, passed away need to happen. Um, so that's the first question. And the second, the, ne the next question is, is baby in immediate, in any immediate danger? And so then we would advocate if they're after 26 weeks of pregnancy, then you'd have a non-stress test. And in the UK, I know that um, in some providers in the US, they would still do a stress test. You know, um, it's one of those things that, that differs around the world, but you need some sort of assessment of your baby's heartbeat. Now, if that's normal, um, then the next question is, is there any evidence that baby's placenta is not working normally? So going back to that initial research that showed um, um, that some babies who aren't moving normally, the placenta is not moving. So sorry, the placenta is not working. Um, so we can then do an ultrasound scan for baby's growth the water volume around baby and the blood flow through baby's cord. And if we do all of that and all of that's normal, then I think we can reassure mums. If, um, if we do that and it identifies a problem, then obviously, you know, there are strategies to deal with all of those different problems we identify and it would depend on what stage of pregnancy you were um, and, and what the problem was that was identified. So, um, yeah, I think that's the three steps. And at the moment, there might be other clever scans we can do. We're looking at, you know, can we do a blood test that tells us whether the placenta is working or not? I think all of that's for the future. But at the moment, it's those, fir those first three questions we need to try and work out the answers to. And just to piggyback on this question, someone in the chat said, what if the baby's 37 weeks? I think the question is really if you're so close to full term, do you just trust the mom and take the baby out or? No? Yeah, and particularly if there was recurrent move, recurrent reduced movements. So if mum, you know, has come twice after 37 weeks, then, um, you know, then I think you need to have a sensible discussion with the mum about the pros and cons of whether baby should be born or not. And, 
you know, and then make an individualized decision about what needs to happen. Um, I have a question that's um, a little bit more scientific. I've heard from doctors that in US that we don't have enough data, enough data to tell that fetal movements, tracking the fetal movements is a um, good method to avoid stillbirth. However, it's shown some success in UK, in Australia, and I think Norway, the northern countries. How can we explain that? The research doesn't tell us that, but then um, the observation does. So I, I think that's a really good, that's a really good question. I think part of it is because when we do different study designs, they're usually different sizes. Now, because stillbirth is thankfully relatively uncommon, it's still much more common than we would like. But to do a definitive study somewhere like the US or the UK to tell us whether fetal movement awareness um, makes a difference to stillbirths, we need about 300,000 women in each arm of the trial. So over half a million women all told. Now, we can't do that on an individual basis. It would be unfundable. You know, we couldn't. It would cost so many millions and millions of pounds. So what people have done is they've done cluster trial, what we call cluster randomized trials. So they randomize a hospital and everyone in that hospital gets the same treatment. Now, the problem with doing that is that particularly now with the Internet and everything else is that that people are not as isolated as they were. So there's, you know, you might not want somebody in the cluster to know about awareness of baby movements, but actually they might still know about it, whether you've told them or not because of the internet and everything else. So it just becomes far trickier. Um, and I think that's one reason that because observational studies tend to have much bigger numbers than the trials, mm -hmm. that you end up with this, um, you know, slightly conflicting data. Okay. So that, that's why. So the, the people who just want to rely on beautiful randomized control trials say, well, you know, we can't be sure that it works. However, the world's more messy than that, isn't it? We don't, we don't do everything because it, there's a randomized control trial. So no, I say that all the time because obviously yeah. in your country too, there is more awareness of fetal movement already. You know, there's a lot of awareness, a lot of programs and protocols, everything. So to do the study, I think actually the United States would be a better area. If anyone no, has, absolutely. And I, I think we don't have any awareness. So help us spread the awareness and also do your study here. <laughs> I, I think that's a really good point, actually, um, is that is that the US would actually be a really good place to do a study, because also you could argue it's sufficiently big that you could do, you could have geographically separate um, um, clusters. So I think actually the US is somewhere where we should think really carefully about whether this, this, this might be the best place to do a study like that, because that's what we need to do really to kind of end the argument. Okay. Okay. However, for um, the creep that or seeds that we call here, it was not there was not done like a randomized trial, right? So we yeah, no, absolutely. How many babies we saved since then? Um, and and I think that's a really important thing to remember, is that is that there was never a trial about putting babies on their back to sleep. Yeah. But actually, because somebody, you know, it, the same observation kept happening again and again and again, that people, you know, 
people won an argument essentially they kind of said you know are we going to do any harm by doing this you know because actually that's the other thing is <clears throat> our, we don't want to do anything that's harmful and you know the bank the back to sleep campaign people said well actually you know how harmful is it going to be to put a baby next back to sleep and they said okay well it isn't and then they showed that when you had the campaign SIDS rates dropped enormously so yeah I think it's a really good analogy my follow-up really on that is as well like how do you actually perform a stay like that? I feel like it's not okay I feel like I would be really angry if I didn't get this information and then all the other women got it and you guys were just experimenting on my family you like to see if we will survive pregnancy without knowledge yeah. just knowledge I, I guess I guess it's tricky you know it's tricky but you wouldn't deprive anybody of the care that um they already have they already have you know you can't take you would never take away from anybody um you know you couldn't put anybody in um you know like in sort of some sort of hermetically sealed room and say no 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 you're not allowed to go on the internet and you're not allowed to learn anything or do anything but but i think what you're saying is and has come out from the, the things that you've read actually if we the intervention really would be about educating women but also educating professionals to make sure that when women went to hospital for example with reduced movements they weren't dismissed and their concerns weren't dismissed because there's no greater disincentive than if you know you you've been told to go in and and tell someone your baby's not moving and then you go and do that and someone says you know that's a bit silly why have you bothered coming in you know because then you'd think oh well I won't bother doing that next time and 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 that's really really critical because we know that mums who have more than one episode of reduced movement so actually it's a higher risk of stillbirth than if you just have one so actually dismissing people's concerns and making them feel silly that would stop them coming back to hospital again is actually a really really bad idea because they're the they're the mums who you probably really really do want to come in yeah I mean any good doctor that I've spoken to about it's like of course we want them to come in anytime and I think that's the thing is, is it's about if we can just generate that evidence that it that it's about winning over the people who aren't convinced. You know, I guess it, it's always going to be easier for us to, to preach to the choir, isn't it? Um, what we have to do to get really good care for everybody else is to is to get the people who you know, don't believe us. Okay, Professor Hizo, thank you so much for showing up and telling us, educating us about freedom of man. Um, it's and been really nice talking to you. It, is there anything else um, that you want to tell the moms that are watching? Um, no, I mean, I think it, it, I would I would say, you know, to trust your instinct, that if yeah. you're worried about, uh, not just about baby movements, but if you're worried about any symptom, and that could be abdominal pain, it could be bleeding, um, you know, it's important that you speak to somebody about it rather than, um, you know, dismissing it as just one of those things because it might not be yeah never think you're paranoid or that you're bothering the doctors or the nurses it's always better to check out yeah okay. yeah that's Thank what we're there for we'd rather be bothered and there'd be nothing wrong than people um they come to us when it's too late that's the saddest part of our job right yeah okay Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Thanks ever so much, Fernanda. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.